Should Christians support the state of Israel? Today, I'm not talking about political mandates. I'm talking about theological mandates. Is there a theological obligation for Christians everywhere to support the state of Israel? Today's Dr. Taylor Marshall podcast is going to be a little spicy, a little hot. I suspect there will be people fired up, and I will do some Q&A towards the end. So if you're fired up, I want you to chime in, do some Q&A. I am live right now on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, everywhere. So let's get into it. Do Christians have a theological and moral obligation to support the state of Israel? Well, this debate centers primarily on a form of theology called dispensationalism. What is dispensationalism? Dispensationalism was started in the 1830s by this man right here. That's John Nelson Darby. This is in the southwest of England. He was with a group called the Plymouth Brethren, a small Protestant sect. And if you're a Christian from Eastern Orthodoxy, Catholicism, Lutheran, Calvinist, Presbyterian, Dutch Reformed, any of these kind of more historical understandings, the theology of Darby does not fit. I mean, the basic understanding of the relationship between God's plan with Adam and Eve up through Noah and Abraham and Moses and David and the prophets and then John the Baptist preaching the coming of the kingdom and then, boom, the Messiah, the Son of God, coming onto the scene, teaching for three and a half years, suffering the passion, the crucifixion, the death, rising on the third day, and commissioning the apostles with a church, an ecclesia in Greek. That is the traditional understanding of what we call redemptive history. The dispensationalists understand that Primarily, God's chief plan, coming again from Darby. Here's Darby back on the screen. God's plan A was always the children of Abraham, whereas the more traditional covenantal understanding of redemptive history in the Bible is that God's plan with Adam and Eve was to redeem all of mankind, every tribe, tongue, and nation. That was the intention from the beginning, and that he chose one nation descending from Abraham, Israel, the Jews, he chose one nation as a safe place, you could say as a landing pad for his divine son, Jesus Christ, to be born and to live and to redeem not just the Jews, the Jews first, but also the Gentiles, the non-Jews, all nations. That's a more covenantal understanding of redemptive history, and it is the majority position in Christian theology. What Darby did is he saw history in, it's called dispensationalism, dispensations. And so dispensations are chopped up. Here's an example of various dispensational. There's got the seven or eight step. You got the four step. You got the three step. At the bottom, you can kind of see covenantal. That's just Old Testament, New Testament, old law, new law. That's how Thomas Aquinas talks about it. That's kind of the more Catholic, historical understanding. Whereas the dispensationalists are chopping up things a lot more. And here's where it gets interesting with Israel. If God's intentional, original plan A was for Israel, and Darby reads the New Testament, and he realizes that the majority of Jews in AD 33 did not have faith and accept Jesus Christ as their Messiah. Many did. Peter, Paul, Stephen, the apostles. There was thousands baptized on Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. But the majority did not. And so for Darby, that's a problem. And so he said God paused plan A, and he, he brought in a parenthesis. 
This was a parenthesis in God's plan that was for the non-Jews. And it, the parenthesis is called the church. And for Darby, instead of having a covenantal sort of progressive, linear understanding of the Bible, there's this parenthesis now in redemptive history, and that's the time of the Gentiles. And eventually God will unpause or end the parenthesis, and he'll bring back the plan, the original plan for the Jews. And that's going to be an end time scenario. Now, Darby's dispensational theology did not catch on. It was not popular. It was unusual. It was even deemed heretical. But in 1948, as you know, after World War II, the state of Israel was created. And suddenly there was all this speculation. And of course, the dispensationalists who followed Darby, who is dead now at this point, are saying, wow, this, this sort of vindicates what Darby was teaching. Maybe God is done with us, the Christians, the church, and he's going to flip the switch and go back to his plan for Israel. Because look, there's now a secular state on the map called Israel. We need to be supporting this. Our time is done. And by the way, that end of that parenthesis for the, the uh, Christians is called the rapture. All right, a pre-tribulation rapture. If you out there believe in a pre-tribulation rapture, you are a dispensationalist, whether you know it or not. You are. This is why Catholics, Eastern Orthodox, and most Protestants do not believe in a pre-trib rapture because they do not follow Darby. Darby is the one who creates this. And you can see this in these charts, right? And by the way, there's a lot of disagreement amongst dispensationalists. Here's all the different varieties of dispensational. But the key point is, in the 1950s and 60s, the theology of Darby becomes more popular. And in the 80s, Jerry Falwell, the televangelist, jump on the theology of Darby, and they push dispensationalism. And this is when, in the 80s, this is when you have all this discussion about, you know, 88 reasons why the rapture will happen in 1988. You have televangelists saying, send me all this money and I'll send a portion of it to Israel. We need to fund Israel. We need to support Israel. It all goes back to this aberrant theology of John Nelson Darby with dispensationalism. And the whole idea is God is about to be done with us, non-Jewish Gentile Christians. And now we need to put all of our resources into the state of Israel. So now that I've explained the history and the theology of dispensationalism from John Nelson Darby, also I forgot to mention the Schofield Bible, which was very popular, especially in the 80s and the 90s. The Schofield Bible was deeply dispensational. So between Jerry Falwell and the Schofield Bible, the dispensationalist movement took root in America. And right down the street from me, Dallas Theological Seminary became the seminary of dispensational theology. So much so that really, if you're in the Pentecostal movement, if you're in a Bible church, a mega church, and some Baptist churches, you have been receiving for years dispensational theology. So when you talk to these dispensationalists, whether they know they're dispensational or not, we call them dispies. When you talk to the dispies, and you say, should we be sending money, guns, everything we got to Israel? They will say yes, and they won't give you a political answer. They will say it's in the Bible. It's prophecy. It's fulfilling the prophecies. We are coming. They don't maybe know the theological language, but they think that they're coming to the end of the dispensation of the Gentiles, and they're going to be raptured out, and God is going to bring in this new dispensation of Israel. Now, there are some things in there that have parallels to truth. For example, in the Catholic Church, uh, it goes back to the earliest church fathers. I recorded all of this in my recent best-selling book, Antichrist and Apocalypse. This is a Catholic commentary, number one Catholic, number one commentary on the book of Revelation currently, and it's from a Catholic point of view. I go through the church fathers, early saints, Old Testament, New Testament, and give a, an outline of what all the early Christians believed about the Antichrist and the Apocalypse. The book also includes a line-by-line, -line, verse by verse commentary on the book of Revelation. I'll send you a signed copy if you go to patreon.com forward slash Marshall. You can also get it audible, Amazon, 
wherever books are sold. The, there is a Catholic conviction that at the end, all the Jews on earth, all the Israelites on earth will have a mass conversion and will be baptized and will enter the church under the reign of the Antichrist. This has to do with the prophecy, the two witnesses in Apocalypse chapter 11, Enoch and Elijah. It's all there in the book I just mentioned. So the idea that the Jews will return at the end is something that I think the entire, every Christian has always believed, and it's in St. Paul. It's also in the Apocalypse. I'm going to go into those verses too if we have time today. But the idea that there's this dispensation and this on-off switch is not good. I would say it is heretical. And I want to look at some of the verses right away over what is Israel? That's the question. Today, because there is a place on the map called Israel, people read their Bible, and when they see the word Israel, they might wrongly think, oh, it's talking about what I see in the Middle East from 1948. But St. Paul in Galatians, actually, I want to do the Romans one first. In Romans, St. Paul talks about Israel and Gentiles and Jews and all that, and he uses an analogy that's really helpful. It's the analogy of the olive branches. So in verse 16, this is Romans chapter 11, for if the first fruit be holy, so is the lump also, and if the root be holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches be broken, and thou, being a wild olive, are engrafted in them, and are made partaker of the root and of the fatness of the olive tree, boast not against the branches, but if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. So what's going on here? He's saying, look, if you're a Gentile, he's writing to the Romans, right? The Romans are Gentiles. If you, as a Roman have been engrafted into the olive tree by your faith in Jesus Christ, you're justified. Do not boast against the branches that have been broken off. What's he talking about? As you see, we'll get into this a little bit. He's talking about the juice. He's saying throughout Romans that just because they're of the children of Abraham and just because they attempt to keep the law, they don't fully keep the law, but they attempt to keep the law because they do not receive Jesus as the Messiah, they are broken off the olive tree. I know that's not politically correct to say. I know that's not ecumenical to say, but that is what St. Paul says. Let's go back and see what else he says. Verse 19, and that will say then, the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well, because of unbelief, they were broken off. But thou standest by faith, be not high-minded, but fear. So this is important. You know, we, we Gentiles cannot say and wag their finger and say, ha ha, we believe in Jesus, you don't, and denigrate. Paul's saying, hey, you got to be careful, be fearful, tremble, because they were broken off and you can be broken off. Keeps going. Verse 21. For if God had not spared the natural branches, fear, lest perhaps also he spare not thee. This is kind of a hit against the whole once saved, always saved. Just because you're in the olive tree doesn't mean you can't be broken off because of your unfaithfulness to God. You're justified by faith. Stand in your faith. Verse 22. See then the goodness of the severity of God towards them indeed that are fallen, the severity which towards thee the goodness of God. If thou, art, if, thou, if thou abide in goodness, otherwise thou shalt be cut off. And they also, if they abide not still in belief, shall be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. For if they were cut out of the wild tree, which is natural to thee, and contrary to the nature, they were grafted into the good tree, how much more shall, thou, shall they that are natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree? For I would not have you ignorant, brethren, of this mystery, lest you be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in a part has happened in Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles should come in. What he's saying is there's one tree. Darby and the dispensationalists would say there's Israel and there's church. Two dispensations, two covenants, independent. That's not what Paul's teaching in Romans 11. 
There's one olive tree. It's been there since the time of Adam and Eve. It is the faithful elect, those who are redeemed, those who have faith in God and promise in the coming of the Messiah. Those who do not accept the Messiah, Jesus Christ, are broken off the olive tree and removed. Then God, through a miracle, takes Gentiles, non-Jews, and he grafts them into the olive tree. And he says there's this mystery that for the greater part, there is a blindness over Israel, that is, over Jews. That is the New Testament, that is the apostolic, that is the Pauline understanding of the people of God, of the church, of Israel. We see this also in Paul when he's talking to the Galatians, also Gentiles. In verse 13, I mean, this, this passage here shatters the dispensational argument. Verse 13, for neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law, but they will have you to be circumcised that they may glory in your flesh. So here Paul's talking to the Galatians. He's saying there's a bunch of Judaizers who are trying to get baptized Christians to also be circumcised. Paul says, do not get circumcised. You do not have to become a Jew in order to be saved. Verse 14, but God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified to me and I to the world. Verse 15, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. So Paul here is saying, it doesn't matter if you belong to the Old Testament law, which entails circumcision for entry. What matters now that Christ has come, he's incarnate of the Virgin Mary, he's died on the cross, he rose on the third day. What matters now is that you are a new creature in the new creation of Jesus Christ, who rose on the first day of the week to signify a new creation with him as the new Adam in a new covenant. This is what Paul's teaching us in Galatians. Verse 16, And whosoever shall follow this rule, peace upon them and mercy, and upon the Israel of God. He just said above in Galatians that those who seek justification by circumcision and fulfilling the law are accursed by the law. But those who have faith in Jesus Christ receive grace and peace and mercy. So here, who is the true Israel of God? The church. The universal church is the true Israel of God because she is faithful to the bridegroom, Jesus Christ. She is made alive through the justifying grace of Jesus Christ. That's the whole message of Galatians. So then we go to verse 17. From henceforth, let no man be troublesome to me, for I bear the marks of our Lord Jesus in my body. By the way, the Greek there is stigmata for marks. Interesting. Verse 18, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brethren. Amen. So there is St. Paul, both from Romans and Galatians, describing how we really have one entity. You can call it Israel. You can call it church. And that's why Catholics refer to the Catholic Church as the new Israel and the new Jerusalem. And if you read the book of the Apocalypse, the book of Revelation, the whole point of the book, the ending of the book, of Revelation is the new Jerusalem, not the old Jerusalem. In the book of Revelation, the old Jerusalem gets destroyed. The new Jerusalem is established by God, and that new Jerusalem is clothed in the white linen of the works of the saints. That's what it says. The, the new Jerusalem is the church, and it has true continuity with the faithful of the old Jerusalem and the Old Testament. It's a linear progression through time because God is one. God doesn't change his mind and say, oh, the Jews didn't accept Jesus. Flip the switch. Let's go into a parenthesis, a new dispensation. Gentiles, okay, that's over. Flip the switch off. God is not in heaven pulling levers. God is all wise, and he has a plan. He has understanding. By the way, if you're liking this one, give this video a like and a thumbs up. Boom. Also, subscribe if you're new. Hit the button subscribe, hit the bell, be notified for future content. 
I want to go back into the Gospels, because you might be thinking, well, that's Paul. Anytime someone, by the way, says that's Paul and Jesus, you got heresy on your hands. But I do want to go into our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ's teaching on what it means to be truly an Israelite, truly a child of Abraham, Matthew chapter 3, verse 9. And think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham for our father. So you got people at the time of Jesus, and they're saying, well, I descend from Abraham. I have Abrahamic DNA in me, so I get a pass. Jesus is saying, you don't get a pass for saying, oh, well, we're children of Abraham. We have Abraham as our father. For he says in the next half of the verse, for I tell you that God is able of these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Luke chapter 3, verse 8, also says the same thing. Bring forth, therefore, fruits worthy of penance, and do not begin to say, we have Abraham for our father. For I say to you that God is able of these stones to raise up children to Abraham. You see, there is a false dispensational belief that because certain people have Abrahamic DNA, and by, what, by the way, the Arabs have Abrahamic DNA, that that somehow excuses them or that they go to heaven de facto because of DNA or because they attempt to fulfill the 613 laws of the Torah that they will be justified. Where in fact, on Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, the Jews come to Jesus and say, what must we do to be saved? Does Peter say, hey, you guys got the right DNA, don't worry about it? Does he say, you guys keep, keep, keep the kosher, keep the law, you're going to get there, keep trying? Is he ecumenical in that way? No. Peter says, repent and believe in Jesus Christ. Be baptized and receive the Holy Spirit, Acts 38. 2.38, Acts 2.39, for this gift is to you and your children. Peter holds forth the only way to remain not broken off from the olive tree, but to stay grafted in the tree and to have the vitality of the plant flowing into you. I am the vine, you are the branches, Jesus says, is to repent, believe, and be baptized and receive the Holy Spirit. That is straight up New Testament, right out the Bible. That is a covenantal understanding of salvation, a covenantal understanding of the Bible, and a covenantal understanding of redemptive history from Adam and Eve all the way up through the prophets, John the Baptist, Jesus Christ, and then his commissioning of the apostles to extend and establish the church, first in Jerusalem, then in Samaria, and then to the ends of the earth. That's Matthew chapter 28. Now, within the Catholic tradition, we also have many popes stating, because there was all this talk in the 1800s and 1900s, maybe there should just be a pure ethno-state that's Jewish. And maybe that should be in historic Palestine, in Israel. Pope Pius X, this is going to trigger a lot of people. Trigger warning. Pope Pius X, 1904, says, We are unable to favor this movement. We cannot prevent the Jews from going to Jerusalem, but we could never sanction it. The ground of Jerusalem, if it were not always sacred, has been sanctified by the life of Jesus Christ. As the head of the church, I cannot answer you. Otherwise, the Jews have not recognized our Lord. Therefore, we cannot recognize the Jewish people. And so, if you come to Palestine and settle your people there, we will be ready with churches and priests to baptize all of you, end quote. Very based. You see, the church of Jesus Christ, the branches that are connected to the Messiah, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, their chief concern for the Jewish people is not to give them land, not to give them helicopters, missiles, guns. Pius X says it right here. We'll be there waiting for you with churches and priests ready to baptize you. Because Paul VI is thinking 
I mean, sorry, Pius X is thinking like St. Paul. I said Paul VI. Man, that was a slip. Pius X is, is thinking like Paul. What is the desire of Jesus Christ for the Israelite people? The desire is their baptism. What Peter, the very first pope, said, repent and be baptized, believe on Jesus Christ, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This is for you and your children. That is straight out the Bible, Acts 2, 38 through 39. And we see Pius X saying the exact same thing. The heart of Christians, the heart of baptized people, the heart of people who know Jesus Christ should not chiefly be thinking about a political solution. Why? That was the error of Judas Iscariot. Judas Iscariot was disappointed that Jesus was not manifesting a political movement in order to rescue the Jewish people. And for 30 pieces of silver, he betrayed the Son of God because he was disappointed in the mode in which Jesus was there to redeem not only the Jews, but also the Gentiles. And today you have Christians making the same error of Judas. They think that the solution is a political, military construction project that we, they need to hasten in the end times by giving more weapons, more bombs, more war, red heifers, a rebuilt temple. Let me tell you something. The person in the Bible who is going to rebuild the temple and rededicate the temple is the Antichrist. St. Paul says that, that the man of sin, the son of perdition, will exalt himself in the temple of God and demand worship from every single person. Apocalypse chapter 13, he will impose the mark of the beast, 666, on all who will not worship him in the temple. And this is the really scary part about dispensationalism, is that it fuses in a theology that predisposes Christians to believe in the Antichrist, who will be a false messiah and who will rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. That's why it's very important that we follow sacred scripture, we follow St. Paul, we follow St. Peter in Acts 2, we follow what Pius X said. When the state of Israel was being established, I'm talking about the secular state of Israel, 1948, the Pope at the time, Pius XII, And the Pope before, Benedict the 15th, they would not recognize it because, the quote is, this is from Benedict the 15th, he said, the Jewish people have no right of sovereignty over the Holy Land. See, dispensationalism would teach you that because God has two plans, A and B, and he has a a parenthesis, and he has a switch that goes on and off, that if God switches back over to Israel, that somehow the Israelites who reject Jesus Christ as the Messiah somehow still have a divine, a divinely sanctioned right to that geography. And that's not the case. Read the entire Old Testament. Read Isaiah, read Jeremiah, and read Ezekiel. The recurrent theme is, you people are the chosen people, and you have rejected your God. You are unfaithful, and you are acting like a harlot. That's not my words. That's the words of Isaiah, Ezekiel, and Jeremiah. It's in Daniel, too, and the minor prophets. That language is all picked up again in the book of Revelation. You are being unfaithful. And what is the punishment by God throughout the entire Old Testament? from Exodus all the way up to Malachi the prophet. The punishment always comes down to you guys lose Jerusalem and you lose the land, period. 
That is the deal with Almighty God. So for any dispensationalist to come up and say, I know that these people reject the Messiah and do not have faith, but they still have the right to the land is completely unbiblical. I know this triggers a lot of people. Read your Bible. Please sit down. Read your entire Bible. Read Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel especially. Ezekiel really hammers it out. If you do not respond to your spiritual husband, which is Yahweh, Almighty God, Jeremiah talks about the new covenant. If you do not receive the new covenant, the fulfillment of all that I've taught you, before, during, or after, you lose the land. That's the message of the Old Testament. I am going to save you. I am, I am sending a suffering servant. I am, sender, I am sending a Messiah. I am sending you the Son of Man, the Son of God. Psalm 2. Isaiah 53. All those chapters right in there. Receive him. If you don't receive him, you will be broken off the olive tree. St. Paul. The only way you get grafted back in is faith. Baptism, entering into the new covenant. That's Christian theology 101. I'm going to go to Q&A real quick. Before I do, I'm going to answer one objection that I, I haven't looked at the comments yet, but I know it's in there already. And they're going to say, yeah, but Taylor, you're like teaching replacement theology. Replacement theology has become a big time pejorative. It's the idea that the Jewish people are replaced by the Gentiles. I would argue back, dispensationalism is the replacement theology. Dispensationalism says that the church has temporarily replaced Israel, and then Israel will temporarily replace the Gentiles. The real replacement theology is dispensationalism. The classic testamental or covenantal understanding of the Old and New Testament is linear we don't believe that the church replaces Israel. We believe, as Paul says in Romans chapter 11, branches are being grafted into the true Israel, into the new Jerusalem every single day through baptism and through faith, through entering into the new covenant. And on top of that, there is the Eucharist. The one time Jesus teaches the new covenant, he says, take, drink, this is the chalice of the blood of the new covenant. That's when he talks about the new covenant, when he establishes the Eucharist. So to be in full communion with Jesus Christ is to be a partaker of his body and blood. That's why he instituted this mysterious, beautiful sacrament hours, less than 24 hours before he died on the cross. He wanted to unite the Eucharist with his death because the Eucharist presents his death throughout all ages. All right, Q&A. I appreciate it if you use a question mark in the comments. That way I can see that you're asking a question. We are hyped up today. We got 1,200-something uh, people live, lots of people. I'm sure this has been a triggering podcast, but you know what? It had to be said, so let's jump in. Comments and questions. Josephine says, I'm so confused. How about the commandments which says thou shalt not kill? How can the same God order Israel to kill civilians even in Palestine? Well, I think we have to be very careful about commanding, killing, and all that. But we have to also remember that in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, there is sword bearing. The idea that from Adam and Eve until the end of time, God is a strict pacifist and there is no violence is not part of Christianity. Quakers believe that with their oatmeal, but Catholics, the Eastern Orthodox, uh, do not believe that we are a pacifist organization. That being said, there is also the problem. This is sort of your radical weirdo dispensationalist right now. Well, they'll just say, yeah, nuke every, every Palestinian and we need a hundred percent Israelite ethno state. That's God's will. No, hard pass on that. H to the no. And then they'll say, well, that's what the Bible teaches. No. 
All right, back into your comments and into your questions. Ito says, I think Christians should support peace, not Israel, nor Islamists. Yes, I think if we had followed the advice of Pope Pius X, just to put his quote back on the screen here. We cannot prevent the Jews from moving to going to Jerusalem, but we can never sanction it. The ground of Jerusalem, if it were not always sacred, has been sanctified by the life of Jesus Christ. As the head of the church, I cannot answer you. Otherwise, the Jews have not recognized our Lord. Therefore, we cannot recognize the Jewish people. And so if you come to Palestine and settle your people there, we will be ready with churches and priests to baptize all of you. You know, if we had followed that advice and not created an ethno state, the war would not be happening or any of the previous wars and the death and the destruction. I know the answer or the objection to this is, well, then where will the Jewish people be safe? And the answer is Jewish people can be safe in various places throughout the world. It doesn't necessarily need to be in the most dangerous situation of which it currently is. This is all based on theology that they somehow, by divine right, should be in that geography. And Pope Benedict XV says they do not have a divine right to that geography. Good question. Love it. Um, for Americans, this is Equate Bond. America first, America for Americans, help Americans first. Thomas Aquinas teaches that we have solidarity with our neighbors first, and neighbor means near, those who are near. So I have an obligation to those nearest to us. So if my if there's someone, if my next door neighbor hasn't eaten th in three days, I have a moral charity obligation to feed him as opposed to taking that amount of money or food and then sending it halfway across the planet. Because the nearness, right, the proximity creates a greater obligation of charity. So every nation should be taking care of their, well, every man should be taking care of his family. And then every nation with their political leader should be taking first care of those who are near and then extend that charity beyond to whatever ability they have. That's Thomas Aquinas on proximity. Cole says, thumbs up, people. That's right. I mean, we got 1,300 people watching, and we only have 462 likes. That's like a third. You guys need to pump it up, click the like button, get it in the YouTube algorithm. What we really need is we need a lot of Protestant dispensationalists to watch this video. Because I think a lot of them have just been taught, this is the Bible, this is the Bible. And they've never heard that it was invented by a man named Darby in the 1830s. All right, back into your comments and questions. St. Creedmoor 6.5, nice. I'm going to go hunting this weekend with a 6.5 Creedmoor, so good to have you here on the show. Would you care to expand on what St. Pius X meant when he said the church would not sanction? Yeah, remember, it's the church's belief that the holy places of Jesus Christ, sanctified by Jesus Christ, belong to the church. So the tomb of Jesus, the Holy Sepulchre, belongs to the church, uh, not to Jewish people, not to Muslim people, not to pagan people. It's our property. The same for all the holy places in Jerusalem. We make pilgrimages to these holy places. Like I've made a pilgrimage to the Holy Sepulchre, to Nazareth, to all of, to the Jordan River, all of these sacred places. And what happened is, is Christians were always making pilgrimages to these Christian places. And then Islam came in the 600s and said, no more. And they were killing and attacking Christian pilgrims. So the response after that was Christians saying, no, let's go and free the Christian places and protect the pilgrims. And that was the Crusades. I know the Crusades get a lot of, a lot of heat, a bad rap. And some of the Crusades were really dumb and not great. Some of the later Crusades. But the initial response was not just Christians saying, let's go kill a bunch of people in the Middle East, yeehaw. No, it was Islam, whatever these Mohammedans are doing, these Saracens, they are blocking our access and stealing our sacred sites. So what Pius X is saying here is that Jewish people cannot own that which belongs to the church, that which belongs to Christians. 
Maybe I'm wrong, but that's that's what I'm pretty sure that's what Pius X means in that quote. All right, let's get some more questions in here, y'all. This is great. Oh, by the way, I don't think I've said this in the show just because of everything going on politically. I'm in no way in favor of Hamas or Palestinians killing people, anything like that, right? Today's show is not political and I'm not weighing. I don't want people saying, well, you're pro Hamas, you're pro terror. No, I'm coming in today and I'm explaining why there's a lot of confusion theologically, primarily in America, over discussions about Israel. You know, you can't throw a stone in Texas uh, on this topic and someone saying, but yeah, the Bible says support the state of Israel from 1948. Uh, Kiki says, your thoughts on Christian Zionism. This has been 50 minutes of my thoughts on Christian Zionism. Christian Zionism is dispensationalism. Dispensationalism is Christian Zionism. It's the same theology. It's the same thing. So you could rewatch this entire podcast and every time I say Christian, or every time I say dispensationalism, you could read in Christian dispensationalism. I say that right. Every time I say Christian Zionism, you could say Christian dispensationalism. A lot of isms right there. Back to your questions. Betty says the pious tent quote is breathtaking. Wow. Yeah, it's clear, isn't it? It's clear. And just think about it. Why the land of the Holy Land was given primarily so the incarnation of Christ could happen in a sacred place. Why would people who reject the Messiah have a divine right to the land if the whole point of the land is to bring in the Messiah? That's real theology. All right, let's come on back into your questions here. We'll do maybe two or three more. Some stuff here on Our Lady, American Citizens. Uh, Lori says, American citizens don't acknowledge we are in a holy war, whether they like it or not. Uh, yeah, this is not a holy war. I don't know what which way you're going on that. But this is not a holy war. A holy war is fought for the sake of the church, the kingdom of God, the gospel. This war right now going on has none of that, right? I understand that there are Christians living there, but but none of the strategy and none of the rhetoric has anything to do with the gospel or the kingdom of God. What does all Israel mean was asked in the comments. All Israel, especially when Paul talks about it, all Israel is the completion, the universality of all who love God. That's Jew and Gentile. It is the olive tree in its completeness the full elect of God. That is all Israel. All right, let's do one more question here. I wish I had more time to talk about the Antichrist because when you start to understand who the Antichrist is and what he's trying to accomplish, oh, that reminds me, I will be having a webinar next week on the Antichrist and the Apocalypse. So that'll be that's the time I'll have more time to talk about Antichrist. So um, I will add that link below. So check that out. Uh, I will be doing a webinar next week, and it's going to be incredible on Antichrist, Apocalypse, etc. So check that out. I'm glad I just remembered that. <laughs> I'm like, how come I haven't talked more about the Antichrist? That's right. I'm doing a webinar next week on the Antichrist and the Apocalypse. All right, one last question and comment. Uh, what is your opinion for America? Your opinion on how to get Americans to unite under God, given the plurality of Protestantism in USA? I got a really good opinion, a really good plan, and that is all of us Catholics have to be loving, gracious, smart enough, know our theology to bring all of these Protestants into the one church. That's the only way to do it. You can't unite 45,000 different denominations of Protestantism. All right, uh, one last question. Here's Laura Lee. This hits home here. I'm a child of a Messianic Jew, so I'm a Christian. However, I have some concern my Catholic schoolmates and their parents called me a Jesus killer. Are we going to come back to that? All right, Laura Lee, that's a great question. No, absolutely not. The Council of Trent taught officially that all of us by our sins killed Christ. 
Let me repeat that. The Council of Trent taught all of us by our sins killed Christ. Every time I commit a sin, especially after baptism, I am nailing the nails into the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. And remember what St. Paul said, that the branches that have been grafted in, the non-Jews, should not boast, talk down to those that were originally there, the Jews. We're saved by grace. We're saved by mercy. Trash-talking is opposed to the gospel. And Paul teaches that explicitly in Romans chapter 11. So, yeah, uh, you're a Messianic Jew. You're fulfilled as a, as a Catholic, as a Christian. No one has any right to come and say, you're a Jesus killer. That's an abomination. Thanks for that comment. Thanks for that question. It's a good one to end on. Thanks, everybody, for watching. I will look for the webinar next, this coming week. It's going to be amazing. Please sign up for it. I know we are limiting it to the first, I think, 1,000 or 2,000 people. So there is uh, a limit on it. So when you see, you can click the link below. Or when you see it on the channel, or you get an email, if you're on my email list, you can uh, sign up and reserve your spot. We're going to talk about the Antichrist. Who is the Antichrist? What does the book of Revelation say? The apocalypse? All of that. We're going to go through five major topics. So make sure you signed up for that webinar. And until next time, remember our Lord Jesus Christ says you're the light of the world and the salt of the earth. So go out there and be salty. God bless. Godspeed. Make sure you like the video, subscribe, and check out my other videos on the book of Revelation. There's a whole playlist. Click on it and get started.